as you can see, he's a clinical consultant in this uh, group. So thank you, Derek, for the kind introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk about something very specific, and that is uh, about GCMAF and its use in treatment of uh, ME-CFS. So we're talking about macrophages, and macrophages are the major phagocytic and antigen-presenting cells, and it is the first step with antigen presentation to B and T lymphocytes in the development of both humoral and cellular immunity. Lack of macrophage activation leads it to immune suppression, and then a number of infections uh, can evolve. Microbial infection induces inflammation that results in macrophage activation as for innate defense. <coughs> so administration of an inflamed tissue lipid metabolite lysophosphatidylcholine activates macrophages. This was done in vitro by uh, groups like uh, from Yamamoto from Philadelphia. Inflammation-derived macrophage activation processes require GC protein, and GC protein is the vitamin D binding protein. Uh, is, if you recall, vitamin D is a, a lipid, it's a, it's a steroid, so it cannot um, be dissolved in blood, it would float on water. So the body puts a small layer of uh, a protein around it, and that protein is called a GC protein. So this is how it works in the uh, practicality. Uh, on the on this side, you see the GC protein, and the GC protein has on the threonine has a side chain, and the side chain has in fact. Uh, galactose and acetic acid. Now, in order to make from the GC, GC-MAF, which is the activating factor for macrophages, the immune system has to do something. What does the immune system do with it? It removes the acetic acid in the T-cells, the activity of the T-cells, and it removes galactose by uh, interference of the B-cells. So you, so you need normally functioning B and T-cells and then it leaves a single sugar uh, changing the GC-MAF to, uh, changing the GC protein to GC-MAF. So in fact, what GC-MAF is, GC-MAF is GC minus two uh, molecules that were taken off. Now, when we have a compromised immune activation, um, we will see that uh, there, if there is an increased nagalase enzyme, that that uh, nagalase enzyme will cut off the whole part on the triadine. So, in fact, the three uh, parts are broken off, and we get a uh, GC protein that doesn't have uh, this part, and so we get like a, a naked GC muff, and this uh, GC muff is inactive. So the nagalase enzyme removes all the sugars, preventing conversion to GCMAF. The second thing we have to know, we, there are uh, abnormalities in T and B cells in MECFS patients, and we don't really know much about them, but a lot of groups have looked in the past at uh, cytokines and, and at, uh, also at function of B and T cells, and uh, it's likely that these B and T cells are less e uh, effective in reducing the GC protein's ability to create GC-MAF and activate the macrophages. So the uh, idea is if, if you have increased nagalase activity, uh, you're going to have less uh, GC-MAF and uh, your GC protein is not effectively uh, transferred into GC-MAF. So, um, the person who has done the most research over the last 20 years in this area lives in Philadelphia, and uh, Dr. Yamamoto has done some research on in vitro, and he, uh, he, he found that the nagalase, which is uh, alpha-N-acetyl-galactosamidase, uh, 
is in fact uh, also secreted by HIV infected cells and cancer cells. And so he finds an increased negalase activity in HIV infected cells and in cancer cells. And he also found that the negalase is an intrinsic component of the envelope GP120 of HIV. Cancer cells secrete negalates which may originate from genomic activation or from HERFs which are endogenous retroviruses or other viruses active in these cells. Uh, we know that there are a number of uh, cancers that are related to uh, oncogenic uh, viruses and um, we, we know that in a number of cancers there is an increased negalase activity. So, uh, these groups um, of, of researchers have concentrated on uh, HIV and on uh, cancers, and they've had some success uh, with limited amount of patients uh, in these diseases. So, several intestinal bacteria also are producers of negalase. And, uh, this, is, this made it all interesting for me because my group is really looking at, at, at the gut. And uh, we know now that several intestinal bacteria also uh, produces of negalase. And we know that the D-glycosylated GC protein cannot be converted to uh, MAF, which uh, is, uh, again, uh, uh, results into immunosuppression. So, similar to HIV, CFS-ME patients carry multiple infections and reactivate endogenous uh, herpes viruses. And it's not only herpes 6, we see EBV, we see CMV, we see herpes 1, and so on. And uh, with our biopsies we do now in, in different tissues, we also find a lot of herpes 7. <coughs> So the Nagalase activity assay is performed on serum. The assay method is described in the journal Medical Virology in 2009 by Yamamoto. And healthy control Sarah exhibit very low Nagalase enzyme activity. There is some uh, Nagalase enzyme activity in normal people, but it, it's really extremely low. So in fact, uh, if there is pathology, there should be a clear difference between normal people and, and the disease. So we looked at the first 395 ME-CFS patients, which fulfilled both criteria that which are now uh, mostly used. And we found that in my group, uh, average serum nagalase was 1.72 nanomole per, min per minute and per milligram, where the range of these patients was 0.28 to 4.0. The controls, uh, in general have uh, below 0.69 with a range of 0.35 and 0.68. So um, there is a clear difference between these groups and only 12 out of 395 patients had a normal negalase activity. So serum negalase is increased in, in, in proportion to uh, normal controls in 97% of the study population. So also Dr. Cheney started studying uh, this, this pathway and he found that negalase activity is inversely correlated with CFS clinical stages with the classical Karnofsky score, uh, which most of you know. He studied 50 ME CFS patients. Average uh, negalase activity is uh, 3.0 in his group, but I must say he has uh, a selected small group of very sick patients where mine is much more heterogeneous, and um, with a range of 0.8 to 6.7, uh, meaning that if you compare it to uh, the healthy controls, all of the patients fall out of the normal range. And so the Kar Karnofsky score correlated inversely with the negalase activity, uh, and the p-value was uh, here very, very significant. So. Um, Recently, and I haven't shown this anywhere, uh, this is the first time I show these, uh, these data, um, we looked at uh, patients with a relatively low negalase activity and then all the patients with two point, uh, more than 2.0 uh, nanomole per milligram and per milligram. 
And so I had 24 patients in one group and 44 in the other group. Here, the, the Nagalase activity was low, and here it was on the average almost three. Um, the two groups uh, did not change, were not different from uh, in age. Uh, BMI is not different. And you can see that, in fact, there is no difference in VO2 max in, this, in these two groups. Uh, so the Nagalase is not responsible for exercise capacity changes. So uh, this is not a good uh, parameter to use VO2 max uh, to in, in, in these patients. So the origin of uh, Nagalase activity in CFSME is unknown at this moment. There are several hypotheses. There's viruses, retroviruses, uh, reactivation of herpes viruses. There's the intestinal bacteria, and there is the increased apoptosis uh, with uh, the HERFs, the endogenous retroviruses, that also could play a role in initiating more Nagalase activity. Now, this is from another study we did in Norway. And uh, this morning, somebody asked about the extremely uh, the sick patients, the, the bedridden patients. Well, we did a study looking at uh, patients with a Karnofsky score of 20 to 30. And there, was, there were maybe two that we could say had a Karnofsky score of 10 uh, at some moments. But so they were extremely, they're all bedridden patients. Uh, they, they don't come out of bed anymore. And uh, we uh, compared with moderately ill uh, patients with a Karnofsky score of 60 and 70, with contact controls, which were the nurses and the, uh, the people that took care of these bedridden patients, and with non-contact controls. And we looked at the classical um, changes, EBV, HV6, Borna virus, and so on, but we really didn't find any differences in these uh, four groups. But we were interesting in the gut, and that's why we uh, looked at LPS, LPS, or lipopolysaccharides. Uh, the lipopolysaccharides we find in the blood uh, come from uh, intestinal bacteria, and mostly from gram-negative. Gram-positive also have a little bit of LPS, but they have more peptoglycans. But uh, gram-negative bacteria are responsible for the majority of the LPS. And I know this slide is not too good in color, but uh, if you see the Karnofsky group, with uh, people with the Karnofsky group is very low, the bedridden ones, they have, uh, in fact, uh, an increased uh, LPS when you compare it to the ones that have uh, moderate disease, and there is a clear difference with the controls and, and the contact controls. And really, in the contact controls, there was no difference with the controls. Now, the normal values of LPS are about uh, are below five picograms per milliliter. In our group, we found uh, people with up to 100 picograms per, per milliliter. LPS is one of the most immunogenic substances that we have in our body. So normally, the circulating LPS is extremely low. Uh, is it, we, we, we did a, a larger number of controls afterwards, and uh, the maximum value we found in controls was six uh, picograms per, per milliliter, where you here have uh, extremely high levels of LPS, and uh, people who work in intensive care and who see shock and so on, they were shocked by seeing these, these data. So we know that um, extremely ill patients and also moderately ill patients have increased circulating LPS, which uh, suggests increased intestinal permeability, what is also called uh, in general leaky gut syndrome. And so the most likely explanation here is uh, altered intestinal flora together with a change in permeability. So, this is part of another lecture, so I'm not going to go on on this. I'm going to come back uh, on uh, the, um, uh, the infectious susceptibility of the macrophages for GCMAF. There is an individual degree of responsiveness of uh, vitamin D binding protein and for the macrophage activating, and it's dependent on the vitamin D receptor, the so-called VDR gene polymorphism. And there are two single nucleotide polymorphisms, BSM-1 and FOK-1, in the population. 